And good morning. Welcome once again to Portland Bible Church. We're here in Vancouver at our house. We call it our church in exile at the Glenny Ranch. So welcome all of you who are here live in person, those who are live streaming on Judy Glenny's Facebook page, and those who will follow us later on YouTube at the website. I wanted to mention one thing on the Facebook. If you use the cell phone, they keep changing things around there, but you go to Judy Glenny, and then you'll probably need to go to Judy's Posts and uh, to find our posts. So anyway, they're over there. Uh, it seems like people have found it, and maybe I'm having the trouble finding it, but it is there for you, so uh, you can get that. Also, you can get it at the uh, website or Facebook on your computer, and uh, at the website, you go to the services at the top of the uh, homepage, and there's a drop-down menu. You get down, and you can listen to previous services, and there's a link there for YouTube. So thank you so much for coming. Remember, our services are this morning at 10 o'clock right now. At 11.15, we take a little break in between for some goodies we have out here. So we encourage you to join with us for the fellowship and the uh, smorgasbord we have here. And so we have that on Sunday. And then at 11 o'clock, uh, 11.15, we have our second service. It's consecutive, so we teach uh, uh, the two services, one after the other. It's not the same service. They're different. We're going through Hebrews. We're in chapter 6, uh, down around verse 9 right now. I think we just finished verse 9. So we'll look at that this morning. And then on Thursday, we have our study of leadership. We've been going through the great leaders of the Old Testament. Uh, we're now beginning the kings with King uh, Saul, David, and Solomon. Of course, Saul's not the great king, uh, but we have the con contrast between the great leaders and the not so great and the terrible leaders, although we're not going to spend much time on them because the northern kingdom uh, had no good kings. I was looking in a book and it got bad, 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 bad. Bad king, bad king. Anyway, the northern uh, uh, kingdom called Israel, southern kingdom called Judah, uh, obviously had a number of good kings, but they weren't all good either. So we find out that even with the good kings, uh, there are uh, problems and sins because all of us have old sin natures. And so there's no perfect king except the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes to reign as king of kings and lord of lords. At any rate, uh, our service is then Thursday at 7 o'clock. After that service, we have our prayer meeting. So if you have praises or prayer requests, please let me know. Give me a call or one of the deacons, and we'll be sure to pray for that or give God a praise for an answer to prayer. <clears throat> so thank you for that. And it's always our custom. Oh, and I forgot one more, and that's on Wednesday at uh, 2 o'clock here at our house. Judy Glennie, my wife, has a Bible study for the ladies. And she's going through First John right now. Uh, it's a great study, and so the ladies are really enjoying that. So, uh, ladies, if you want to join, it's never too late. Uh, to Wednesday at 2 o'clock right here. It's always our custom to take a few moments for silent prayer at the beginning of each of our studies to make sure that we're in fellowship. What that constitutes is being filled with the Holy Spirit. The scripture tells us that we are to be filled with the Spirit, and uh, this, of course, is amplified by the fact that uh, it's a command, meaning that there must be something we can do to fulfill that command. And in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, John tells us, if we as believers, if we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, the ones we just mentioned or recalled, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that would pick up the ones we've forgotten or don't know that we've committed, and then we believe that that gives us the enabling or the filling of the Holy Spirit, whereby we can understand the things of God, the mind of Christ, uh, and the Word of God. So with that in mind, and in preparation for our study this morning, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful that we have another day in freedom in this country that you have provided and blessed us so mightily over the years. We pray that that would continue. We pray that you would have mercy on our nation, even though much of our nation has turned its back on you and your word and your son, Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, we pray for mercy, particularly for the remnant of believers who love you, who are obedient to you. As we study these things this morning, we pray that you would encourage and enable us 
uh, by the things that we study and that we might be edified of soul so that we might do those things that are pleasing in your sight. We desire to be obedient to you, Father, and we recognize that we have difficulty because we have old sin natures. But we pray that your Holy Spirit would be mighty upon us as we study your word, uh, edify our souls, and help us to do those things again that you would desire of us <clears throat> so that we come into your presence. We'll hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. And with these things in mind, then we pray in Christ's name, amen. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of sound mind. Uh, he said in the scripture, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Therefore, we ought to study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Open the word of truth this morning to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. We had uh, finished verse 9, but I wanted to recap. So we're going to go back and take a quick look at that. Uh, we're in chapter 6, and we've been dealing with, particularly in verses 4 through 6, the concept of discipline for believers. I have mentioned to you in that section in verses 4 through 6, as well as we find other passages in the book of <laughs> Hebrews, that there is a difference of opinion among scholars. Many people leave, believe that these are unbelievers that are addressed and that they're just faking it as believers. Others, including myself, believe that they are in fact believers, but they've come under discipline. The discipline is because these are primarily Hebrew believers in the first century, and many of them, while they've accepted Jesus Christ and believe that he died on the cross for their sins, desire to add back all of the ritual and the law of the Moses, and therefore, of course, they make, according to what the writer of Hebrews says, and also Paul in Galatians, that they basically blaspheme the cross and make it null and void. They're saying that Christ's death uh, payment for sin was not sufficient and therefore we need to add some work to it on the back end that is of course fulfilling the Mosaic Covenant and so this of course is the discipline that he describes hoping that they will not fall into this discipline uh, and basically after he goes through that section in four through six uh, he talks about the importance of Bible teaching, and we looked at that in verse 7 where he speaks in a metaphor, and there he speaks about the, uh, the ground that drinks the rain, which often falls upon it and brings forth the vegetation or the fruit. There, of course, the metaphor speaks of the word of God uh, as the rain pouring down upon the ground. And, of course, God also provides the seed. We find elsewhere in a number of passages where that same metaphor is used. He, of course, uh, is the uh, vine dresser. He is the sower of the seed. And, of course, the seed goes into the ground, which is us. And then the rain, the word of God, comes upon us and the seed germinates. And, of course, depending on uh, the type of soil... That would be the type of unbeliever that it falls upon. Obviously, the, uh, uh, the growth is uh, minimal or none or extremely great. And so the desire, of course, of the planter, the sower, the, the God the Father, is that we permit, uh, produce much fruit. And so here it talks about that. It says uh, and uh, it gives a blessing not only to those who hear it, but to those that are involved, the friends of those who hear it, as well as the Lord who recognizes the work of his, uh, his word as it in, gets there. And then verse 8 talks about the other side. If the ground yields thorns and thistles, uh, it is useless and close to being uh, cursed. We noted the fact that it's not cursed, but it's close to being cursed. That indicates that there's a certain discipline and uh, the end is burning. The burning has to do with the judgment seat of Christ for believers. Others suggest that this is the uh, lake of fire, the judge of great white throne judgment. We believe it is not. I believe he's addressing believers. As a matter of fact, when he gets down to verse 9, he starts off, but believers 
or here he says, beloved. It's the only place we find the word beloved in the whole epistle to the Hebrews. Paul uses it extensively, other writers do, and it always indicates that they are believers. And so he is saying we, all the way through here from really verse 1, which talked about pressing on to maturity. So he's talking about believers from verse 1 all the way down to this verse, and he's saying beloved, addressing everyone he's just talked to, those he has just warned, and he says here, we're convinced of better things concerning you, the things that accompany salvation, uh, though we are speaking in this way, assuming again that they have been saved, they have salvation, and he's talking about the discipline that comes. He's going to address that again later on in chapter 12. We'll see that when we come to it. So periodically through the book of Hebrews, we have a number of warnings, and then after the warning, there is a, a blessing for those who uh, heed the warning. I think that's true of scripture all the way through. God warns them. He warned uh, the people of Israel under Moses. We have a whole chapter in Deuteronomy that deals with the blessings and then the failure to do what God wanted them to do and the discipline that was coming. But ultimately, there is going to be uh, the end game where we have uh, the presence with the Lord. And this, of course, is also taught all through scripture. So that really brings us down then to verse 10. Uh, where we left off last time, and in verse 10, it continues on. Uh, we have a conjunction there, uh, which says for, or we might say because, and so here, because God is not unjust, so as to forget your work. The point here is that these are believers, and they have done work. That production, of course, that God speaks about is the Christian way of life, being obedient to God, and therefore they have done work. They have borne fruit, maybe not as much as they should. Maybe they've turned the corner, as it were, in terms of uh, going back to the Mosaic Covenant. And after this appropriate warning and several others that we see through the book of Hebrews, uh, we have here the fact that God hasn't forgot them. He hasn't forgot your work. And so he's not unjust. Uh, so we know that God, of course, is absolute justice. We can study the attributes of God. One of the attributes of God is that he is righteous. That is that he thinks right in every way. But justice means that he also does the right things. So the combination of his righteousness and justice represent the integrity of God. In fact, it's the same thing for us. Right thinking is righteousness. Right doing is justice. And uh, that, of course, demonstrates that we are, in fact, saved. Together, they demonstrate that we have the integrity that God desires for us. So here we see that he has not forgotten uh, their work, and he is not unjust. The work here, of course, is the normal word that we find, and work is used for the Christian way of life, whatever we do. When we think of work, we think of uh, a, a job that we hold down, some type of manual labor. Of course, there are those who do uh, mental labor, such as uh, teachers, instructors, pastors, coaches, other people who uh, do not do physical labor, but all of it is construed as work. <clears throat> Uh, from a physics standpoint, uh, work generally has to do with some physical production. But in terms of the scripture, work would include mental production as well as verbal and uh, physical production. So here it talks about whatever it is that you do, whether it's mental, verbal, or overt work, uh, as unto the Lord is considered bearing fruit. Many times it has to do with the very word of God that you put out giving the gospel, giving principles of the word of God to those who will listen to you. And so all of these things are under the umbrella of work, as we see here. And he says he is not forgotten. He's not unjust to forget your work and love. Uh, it's interesting that uh, we have in the majority text, uh, when I speak of the majority text, I better I better preface that with the fact that we have the Nestle text, uh, which is a text dealing with the, um, the later uh, manuscripts. And then we have uh, the one that has, uh, uh, includes all the manuscripts that we can find. Uh, and so uh, uh, sometimes the uh, combination of these, they have had some differences in the text. Nothing that changes anyone's salvation. Here's an example of that. And so we see, for example, here that it's talking about and the and the uh, and labor of love. And so the as says uh, the work 
uh, has not forgotten your work and your labor of love. The words your labor are not found in some of the manuscripts. I think I said the later ones, the earlier manuscripts uh, do not have this, but the uh, combination, what they call the majority of all the small portions of scripture that have been found seem to be with this. But you can see it doesn't really change a thing. So whether you talk about your love or the, the uh, labor of love, obviously it has to do with the same concept here. And so work is labor, and whether it's the labor of physical, mental, or verbal, or the labor of love, it doesn't change the context or the sense of the passage at all. The word for love is our word agape. We've talked about it many times in the past. There are actually several different words for love. Uh, one of them is agape. It's kind of the universal love. Uh, one person has called it the impersonal love. I'm not sure I really like that word impersonal because I don't think that love is ever impersonal. Uh, but of course, I would like the idea of universal. We love because God first loved us. That means we can love the, the ones who are lovely and lovable, and we can love the unlovely as well because it's commanded as part of the filling of the Spirit that we love our neighbor as ourself, and our neighbor can be a, a person who is generally unlovable, but we love them because of the filling of the Spirit. And so we have this concept of agape love. Then there's philos love, which refers to relationship. In fact, Jesus emphasized that when he was talking to Peter uh, at the end of his uh, work when he was explaining to Peter, do you love me? And he says it three times. And of course, Peter keeps saying uh, agape love. Uh, and then eventually the Lord said, do you love me with philos? And Peter says, you know that I do. Uh, indicate, and then he says, feed my sheep. And the idea is not just a universal love. Do you have this relationship with me? Uh, that kind of love, the philos love. So we see the difference, but here it's simply talking about a universal love that these people have for other people, whether they're other believers, unbelievers, people that are lovable and people that are unlovable. And so it's the agape love, your labor of love or just your love. And so they have this love that they have demonstrated apparently a universal love as well as their work, whatever that is, as unto the Lord. And it says, which you showed towards his name, which you showed towards his name. The word show is interesting. It's in dike. Numi, and it actually means to point out or to, to display. I like the idea of giving an outward demonstration or evidence uh, to his name. In other words, something that is visible. And therefore, apparently, not only have they done a mental work on behalf of God, but they have done visible work and loving people such that it is obvious and evident. And therefore, they're demonstrating that. And it says, towards his name. Uh, we've talked about the word name in scripture, and it's interesting. There are basically three aspects of the word name. Name, of course, we think of our name, my name, Gary. Uh, obviously, I have a personal name. Uh, then we have, uh, obviously, a title. In my case, it would be Pastor Gary Glennie. And so we have that. And then, of course, uh, based on whatever you do in the ministry, we might say Pastor. That would be the title, the name, Gary Glennie. And the work is ministry, what I would do. Uh, under the banner of uh, deaconing, and pastors are deacons, although we think of uh, deacons as those who administer, but de pastors are also deacons. It means a table waiter in the Greek, a, a servant, one who serves tables. In fact, when we do the communion, this is why we have the deacons and they pass the elements of communion. So it has the idea of a servant. And so the ministry uh, is one of service. So we have these three aspects, a personal name, uh, a title perhaps, maybe it's just Mr. or Miss or Mrs. or whatever we want to put there. Could be doctor, uh, it could be a uh, lawyer, or it could be any of these things which describe uh, the person in terms of a title. We think of the Lord Jesus Christ. There we have three descriptive words, and the word Lord itself refers to his uh, identity and title as deity. Whenever we say the Lord, it refers to the deity of Jesus Christ. So that would be uh, the title. His identity, of course, was Jesus. And it's interesting that implicit in that name Jesus, coming from the Hebrew Yasha, means to deliver. And so Jesus comes from uh, Yehoshua, the long form, which means the deliverer or the savior. And so implicit there is the word, but it's also his personal name. And then we get to the word uh, Christ, 
uh, in the New Testament, which is a translation for the word Messiah or Mashiach in the Hebrew. And Messiah refers to his work, the fact that he was sent from God for a specific purpose. In fact, Jesus tells us there are a number of things that were part of the purpose that he came for, obviously to demonstrate who the Father was, uh, but ultimately he says, I came to die. And re he realized that he was going to die for the sins of the world. Uh, he came to uh, set us free from the works of Satan and to shut down the devil. So there are many things that he came to do, but basically it's all under the banner of the word Messiah or Christ. In fact, it means the one who is sent, the one who is sent. So uh, this would be his reputation. So the three aspects of the name of God would refer to the fact that he is God, deity. Secondly, we refer to the second member of the Trinity as Jesus. That's his personal name. And also the work that he did would be the reputation. What's his reputation? In fact, when we give the gospel, basically we give the end game, which is that he was the God-man savior who died on the cross for our sins once and for all time. And if you believe in that, you can have everlasting life. That's the essence of the gospel. That's the reputation. In addition to that, of course, we have many other things. He was capable of forgiving sin because he was God, and he did many wonderful miracles so that he could uh, authenticate <clears throat> who he was. And so his reputation extends basically throughout his life where he lived a perfectly sinless life. So with that in mind, when it says, uh, which you showed towards his name, it refers to all of these, the fact that he is God, the fact that he has a personal name. Uh, if it's the Father, we might say the Father. That would identify the first member of the Trinity, or Jesus, the second member, or the Holy Spirit. All three are mentioned in Scripture and identified uh, by this concept of name. As a matter of fact, many people in the Hebrew faith, even to this day, uh, refer to God by the word name. They do things in the name uh, rather than with regard to God. Uh, many Hebrew people, at least in the past, did not want to mention the name Jehovah, uh, because Jehovah was the sacred name, Y-H-V-H in the Hebrew. So rather than mention that, they would say Adonai which translates as Lord. Now, Yahweh doesn't necessarily mean your Lord, but they translate it that way because they would put in the margin in the text, Adonai, meaning that you don't, you don't want to say the name Lord. It's so sacred. You don't want to give those four Hebrew letters, Y-H-V-H. And so they would simply say Lord, but some didn't even want to say that. And they would simply say uh, that they believed in the name and the name referred to that sacred name, Jehovah, or Lord, and so they would simply use the word name because it included everything that was God, everything that was deity. So when we see it in the New Testament, we bring that thought over, and especially here, because this is written to the Hebrew people. And so uh, whoever wrote this, Apollos or even Paul, it was written to a Hebrew believer or to Hebrew believers. And it's interesting, we have some Hebraisms in here that we're going to see a little bit later. I just uncovered one as I was studying this week. And so we see that he writes in the style of the Hebrew. Hebrew, even though it's in Koine Greek. And so he uses many of the things that would be part of the Hebrew text, and we'll see those as we come to them, because he understands he's writing to the Hebrew people. So when he uses the word name, they understand and he understands that it's the totality of the person of God. And so you showed these things with reference to the name, having ministered to the saints and are still ministering. And so it talks about the fact that they demonstrated towards his name, towards the person of God, having ministered to the saints and are still doing it. So when we are living our life, when we are fulfilling the Christian way of life, when we are bearing fruit, when we're demonstrating doing work and the labor of love, as we said, all of these things are towards God. Whatever we do, we do as unto God. However, there's the overflow because we basically uh, do those things to other believers, to the saints. The word saints, Greek word hagias, means the ones who are set apart. Every one of us, when we believe in Jesus Christ, is set apart unto God for a special purpose. That is to fulfill the plan that he has given and designed for each one of us. Now, we may not fulfill that plan. Many do not. Many also do. 
And so the fact that we are saints does not guarantee that we're going to live saintly lives. Of course, the objective is that we do live as saints. Uh, we've used the illustration uh, uh, of royalty in places where they have kings and queens, like in, East, in, in uh, uh, England. And the fact that a child might be born of the royal family, and of course they call them dukes and different names, but of course they're supposed to live according to royalty, but some of them are brats, <laughs> and they don't live up to the nobility. And so as they're growing up, hopefully they overcome their uh, early uh, bad behavior and begin to understand what it means to live as royalty, as nobility. Same thing is true of Christians. Just because we're saved doesn't guarantee that we have good behavior. Uh, but it, the idea is that we are supposed to, and therefore God has given us the empowering through his Holy Spirit and through his word so that we might live a holy, separated, sanctified, if you will, life. So to the saints, he's ministering to other believers, and he's still doing it. And the word ministering here is the verb diakoneo, from which we get the English word deacon. And uh, diakoneo actually comes from two Greek words, dia and konia. Konia is, of course, a part of the idea here is service. Dia means through, so through service. So they have ministered, how? Through service. They want to take care, they want to support, they want to help, to wait on. As we said, the word deacon actually referred to one who waited on tables. We often go into restaurants and sometimes we are so busy with our conversation and our meal that we forget the person who's waiting on us. And one of the things that is customary, of course, is to give a tip to that person because that work that they do is a noble work. Otherwise, you'd sit there a long time and nothing would happen. Uh, you'd have to go uh, over to the maitre d' and say, I, I, can I order something? And so uh, the service, they come by, would you like some refill on your coffee? Service is very important, and yet sometimes we just blow off that service. We don't realize it. And yet it is so important because each one of us as a believer in Jesus Christ, is a servant of the Lord. So the next time you're in a restaurant, think about that person who's serving you, uh, that they are serving you as unto the Lord, as are you. But they have a particular function. In Greek, that word was diakonos, uh, diakonia. Here's the verb form. So it means one who waits on tables or serves. And so they've been serving. Who have they been serving? Other believers. So the writer of Hebrews acknowledges that they've done some marvelous things. So he just finished chewing them out and warning them, uh, lest they end up in, in some type of burning at the judgment seat of Christ. But then he says, but we expect better things of you. We don't expect that you're going to lose your reward at the judgment seat. And then ministering, they continue to do it. The present participle indicates that he is aware that they are still doing these things. Well, that brings us down then to verse 11. And here we have the conjunction de, they translate it as but in the New American Standard. Uh, either way, and or but would work, it doesn't really make a difference. New American Standard simply uses uh, and, which is the normal translation here. Uh, and uh, so we see, and we, there it is, that first person plural, we. Paul and others use we when he's referring to believers. And so he's using we here, even though this is the writer of Hebrews, same idea. He includes himself in this group from verse 1 all the way down to verse 10. And so here in verse 11, he says, We desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Well, there's a few things here we need to clarify. Of course, we have the first uh, verb, which is uh, to desire, and the desire is to long for, strong desire. Uh, it's a verb epithomeo, which sometimes refers to lust, used with the old sin nature, the lust pattern, but that's a strong desire. Here it's used in its positive sense, simply a strong desire or a longing for. We desire. Nothing uh, sinful about uh, the fact that you desire to do things. Here it'd be more of a strong desire or a longing for each individual of you all. And some people make the argument when he talk about you, he's talking to uh, unbelievers. And when he talk about, talks about we, he includes the believers. But here it uses you all, and these are believers. We desire each one of you all 
to show the same eagerness. Well, if they're unbelievers, they can't show that eagerness because they're not saved to begin with. So here, the you all, second person plural, refers to believers that he's been talking to uh, all through this section. You all show or demonstrate, uh, again, the same eagerness or diligence. I like that word uh, eagerness or diligence. Let's see, the New American Standard here uses uh, a diligence, and that's good. Uh, this is a the, the word that we find in its verb form over in 2 Timothy 2.15, and there we quote that verse uh, periodically, uh, study to show yourself approved unto God. And the word study is actually the verb form that we find here. Uh, here, of course, it's in the noun form, but it means diligence. And we translate it study, and many translations do, but actually in 2 Timothy 2.15, it's this same verb, spudazo. And uh, here it's the noun form, spude, but it means diligence. I always like the idea of uh, almost effervescent. Uh, maybe that's not a good translation of it, but being enthusiastic might be a good one. I often think of opening a bottle of pop that you've shaken up, and what happens? It just sprays all over the place. Or champagne. Some people like champagne for the pop rather than the taste. Uh, but when you open it, it pops, and out comes the champagne. Same thing with soda pop if you shake it up because it has that carbonation in there. And so the word spudazzo has that idea of, uh, of uh, spraying, of excitement, enthusiasm. And so here it's saying that he desires them to have the same enthusiasm, the same diligence, the same zeal. In other words, being fired up. Sometimes in the vernacular, you say, man, I really got fired up the other day. I had a guy when we used to lift weights. He said, boy, I got to get myself fired up so I could lift some heavy weights. And so that's the idea. You want to get fired up for the Lord, get enthusiastic uh, and uh, not just put it on, but actually have it from the Holy Spirit. Obviously, if you can't get excited and be uh, diligent and uh, have zeal because of the Holy Spirit, then perhaps you need to check and make sure you're filled with the Holy Spirit. You may be out of fellowship. And so uh, because you should be excited about the Lord, excited about the word. So he says, uh, uh, I uh, desire that each one of you show the same eagerness, the same diligence. And so actually, if you look back, we had this word over in, uh, in a verb form in Hebrews 4 and verse 11. And therefore it says, let us, again, the writer of Hebrews, so just, just go back to chapter 4 in Hebrews 4.11, let us therefore be diligent. That is the same verb form that we have the noun here. So the writer of Hebrews likes this word, diligent to what? Enter his rest. So we ought to be enthusiastic to enter the rest of God. If you were here when we studied chapter 4, you remember, how is it that you enter the rest of God? Well, there are several rests. One is when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you enter into his rest of eternal salvation. But day by day and moment by moment, as you practice a... Uh, a procedure known as faith rest, which is really described in this chapter. We claim the promises of God by faith, and then we rest in those. That's the life of the believer. I could stop right now and say amen, because that's basically the message. The message, of course, is to trust the Lord. Put your faith in him, not in yourself, not in other people. Faith in the Lord and rest in that. Claim that promise. He said he would do this. I'm resting in that. Uh, when you pray, you pray knowing that God will hear and answer prayers as long as they're according to his will. And so this concept of faith rests. So here he says, let us therefore, believers. So he's not talking here about the rest at the moment of salvation. He's talking about the moment by moment, day by day rest, claiming the promises of God and resting in those. It's easy to talk about. It's another thing to do it. Because when something happens, adversity hits, then we go, oh, no, now what? Well, now it's time for faith. Now it's time to practice, to put into practice what you have learned. Call up those scriptures that give you confidence. Fear thou not. I am with thee. Be not dismayed. All of those promises that God has for you when you have, have adversity. And therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall through following the same example of disobedience, and the disobedience, of course, had to do with Israel in the wilderness. 
Now, many of them were believers. They believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were delivered by Moses. I'm sure there were many believers trying to get a count. I don't know. There was even a mixed multitude. Uh, some of them went for uh, the freedom that was promised by Moses and the people of Israel who were uh, going out into the desert. Obviously, they must have believed something. They were going somewhere. <laughs> I remember uh, one of the lines from the movie, uh, The Ten Commandments. Uh, uh, I think it was Dathan, uh, one of the naysayers. And they and uh, uh, somebody asked him, uh, well, Dathan, where are we going? And he said, to hell, I hope. And I thought, what a sad thing. There was a person who really didn't get it. And that's the idea that uh, uh, where are we going? Some believers don't know where they're going, sadly, because they don't have doctrine. Unbelievers that join with them perhaps don't know either and I suspect that uh, Dathan probably was a believer although in the movie it, uh, it, it portrayed him as totally uh, antithetical and he was Basically, I think he and Abiram and the others that were rebellious, they died the soon unto death, if you read the story of the Exodus. At any rate here, he's talking about the disobedience that the Exodus generation demonstrated when they left Egypt. And so when they were in the wilderness, time and time again, God delivered them with manna, with water, with quail and uh, delivered them from the uh, sting of the serpent. Uh, Moses uh, was instructed to put a serpent, a bronze servant, serpent on a pole, and that they would simply look at it and be healed. Many, many miracles were performed in the wilderness, and yet that whole generation, except for a few uh, that uh, uh, believed, Joshua and Caleb, and the young people under 20 years old, apparently, uh, were all died in the wilderness. Why? Not because they were unbelievers but because they were disobedient and basically perished the sin unto death. Why? Because they were not exercising or entering his rest. Now, the ultimate rest for Israel was to get into the promised land, but that happens under Joshua. It didn't happen all the times in the wilderness, although there was a rest periodically uh, that they had in the wilderness, and God gave them rest from enemies various times and delivered them. So it was a matter of training and preparation. And many times that's exactly what our life is about. It's a preparation. It's a training. I know people don't want to think about that. They think, you know, why am I here? Well, you're in school. You're being trained. You say trained for what? Trained for eternity. And as a believer, you are being prepared for leadership and rulership in the kingdom and beyond. And things that eye hath not seen or ear hath not heard haven't even entered into our minds. So we have no idea all the things that we're preparing for. But your daily life as a believer is training, it's preparation, it's going to school. And I know that may be painful. In fact, I think that's why some people uh, don't go to church because they just don't want to hear it. They just want to live their life. And of course, they wonder why they constantly experience difficulty, adversity, and all of those things. It's because obviously uh, they have set aside the reality and the importance of the Lord's teaching and his preparation that he is giving to us. And that's why we have adversity. Adversity is simply a means of training us to trust the Lord and to claim those promises. So chapter four went all through this idea of uh, the concept of faith rest. So obviously uh, here he's talking about the same thing in this verse 11 of chapter four. Therefore be diligent, enthusiastic to enter that rest moment by moment and day by day. It should be our desire as believers to claim the promises of God and to fulfill them. So that's this word spudazo. I really like it. And again, we saw it there to be uh, to study, but not just to study, to be enthusiastic about your study. And one of the things that I have as a pastor is the joy of daily studying the Word of God. No matter how discouraged I become from time to time, and we all do, and for a pastor to say he doesn't become discouraged, <laughs> he's got to confess that because it's a lie. Because we all do. We're all human. We have all sin natures, all of us. But when I study the Word of God, I'm in a world all of my own. And uh, I'm, I'm communing with the Lord, I'm studying, and I'm refreshed moment by moment, which is why you should be in Bible study, uh, reading your Bible, committing scripture to memory, and of course, uh, uh, assembling yourselves together for the teaching of the word of God. And so here it then says, why, why are we to be enthusiastic and eager uh, and demonstrating these same uh, kinds of attitudes 
towards the full assurance of the hope unto the end. Well, toward is directional, and uh, so it uh, uh, may not even be translated in some cases, but here uh, it says in this verse, so as to realize. And if you look in the margin, if you have a New American Standard, in verse 11, it says, to the full. So, so as to realize is uh, simply uh, uh, the preposition pros and then full assurance. And that's all it is. So uh, they've changed this into so as to realize the full assurance. The little word pros has all of those things that they, so as to realize, basically, is the word towards, directionally. And uh, that's what we find here. And then full assurance, what does that mean? We have the full assurance. The word uh, full assurance is pleroforia. Plero is uh, meaning to fill. Uh, in the Greek, it means to fill up. Plero, P-L-E-R-O, to fill up. And then phoria comes from the word pharaoh, to carry. And so it means to carry the full, carry the full load, if you will. And so uh, towards the carrying of the full load, I translate it this way, carrying fully the hope that you have. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes. Do you believe you're going to live with him forever? Do you believe in the Christian life uh, that you are doing production so as to receive the reward? Yes. Well, that's the confidence that you have. Uh, do you believe you're going to reign with Christ in the kingdom? Yes, I do. Then you carry that full confidence or hope that you have. You have it and you carry it moment by moment. Do you think about that daily? Uh, do you think, you know, uh, one of these days, hopefully very soon, I'm going to be with the Lord and uh, we'll be having that marriage supper and joining Jesus in the communion that he spoke about uh, when he had that last uh, supper with his disciples. We're going to share that with him and then we're going to live and reign with him for a thousand years. We're going to get special decorations and rewards. Do you think about those things? Keeping your mind on the things above, that's what you should think about day by day. Lord, come quickly, as the uh, John in Revelation says, Lord, come quickly. And that's our desire. Uh, but even if he isn't, we're in preparation. And day by day, having our mind on the things above, I think about it. I don't know about you, but I think about the time. What's it going to be like in the kingdom? Perfect environment. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ as King of Kings. We there in some rulership capacity. I want to be a part of that. Don't you want to be a part of that? Well, if you're a believer, you can have that. It's part of the inheritance. It's part of here carrying fully the hope that you have until the end. And so carrying the hope, we have uh, this uh, concept here of uh, carrying the full assurance. And uh, we see that all, all earlier. We saw it over in Hebrews 3, in Hebrews 3, 6. In Hebrews 3, 6, it talked about uh, starting in uh, 5, Hebrews 3, 5. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant. So Moses was a leader, but he was a servant for a testimony of those things which were spoken of later. So Moses becomes a testimony for us because those things were spoken later. We speak them, we read them. And then he says, but Christ, uh, the same idea, a faithful son over his house. Well, what's the house that Christ is a son over? The church, believers. And so his house, whose house we are. We are his house. We are built up as a house. It says that we're building up like you would build a structure. Uh, bricks in a house. Believers are like the foundation and, or the bricks that are built upon the foundation. And then it says, uh, assuming that we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope for uh, firm until the end. The same idea is found here, keeping that confidence to the end. Not so as to gain salvation, but so as to gain a full reward. Elsewhere we see, do not lose what you have and that you could gain a full reward. The objective of the Christian life is to get a full reward. And the reward is above and beyond simply having eternal life and a resurrection body. And you say, well, what is all that full reward? I don't know. Uh, as I say, I had not seen here, I had not heard, but God says that you will get it. You will be rewarded. These things will come, and part of the hope is the anticipation. In fact, this word hope in the Greek isn't like hope in English. Uh, if, if you can look in any lexicon and you look up the Greek word E-L-P-I-S, elpis. Elpis. I always, first year Greek, when we learned that, I always thought elpis sounds like help us. And, uh, uh, but actually elpis, E-L-P-I-S, means hope. But in English, we say, well, 
I hope it doesn't rain today. Um, you know, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And so it's kind of a, uh, just kind of a guessing game. But in scripture, the hope is more confident anticipation. It's not just, well, I hope I have eternal life. No, I know I have eternal life. I have confidence. And that's what it says here. The full assurance of the confident anticipation of what you're going to get as a reward. Uh, in fact, we have the word hope itself in the genitive case. Now, the genitive normally is the possessive case, like we think of it in the English, you know, with the word with the S on the end, uh, the boy's hat or the girl's hat and the apostrophe S. So we normally think of the genitive case as the possessive case, but it has other uses. Here is what we call a genitive of source, which means that the source of our assurance is hope that we have the confident anticipation, and that gives us the assurance that it's going to happen. And so the preposition here, or rather the, uh, the genitive case of uh, Elpis, actually is the basis for our hope. I mean, the basis for our assurance. We hope, and that is the confident anticipation, which gives us the assurance that we will have eternal life, and not only that, that we will have a reward. And then we have the last part, unto the end. Now the question is, the end of what? Well, we have some commentators who suggest that the end here refers to spiritual maturity. That's probably not totally wrong, but spiritual maturity might be something you attain and live another 20 or 30 years beyond the time that you reach spiritual maturity. Is it only gaining spiritual maturity that's the end? That doesn't seem like the end. Hopefully that's the beginning of your uh, living your Christian life to the max. So I suspect he's talking here to the end of the age or the end of your life. Some places the end of the age would refer to the end of the age of Israel, but that would include the future tribulation. I don't suspect he's writing that here. I suspect he is writing to the end of the believer's life. In other words, that you fulfill the ministry that you have as unto the Lord to the end of your life. And so that's how I see this uh, end of life rather than the end of the uh, or the millennial kingdom uh, or simply reaching spiritual maturity. And I think that's certainly possible. And we noted it over there in Hebrews 3, 6, the end there, uh, the uh, hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope. Uh, firm until the end. And I think we noted the same thing there. The end had to do with physical life, whether you're raptured out or you die. Did you uh, have that confidence and that full assurance that comes from hope until the day of your death? That's what we should look forward to. Basically, that we keep that confidence. We don't fail. We don't falter. We don't go back and reject the cross as he is warning these Hebrew believers against. Now, this hope with perseverance is found elsewhere. I don't know if we got time to look at this, but uh, you know, we're just about out of time. Uh, we have uh, Romans chapter 8. We'll just look at that one first, and uh, then we'll have to come back. In Romans chapter 8, 22. Romans chapter 8. And verse 22, and here it says... For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers pain of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves having this, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. That, I believe, is what is the end. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not a hope. So your salvation is not a hope because you already possess it. You don't hope to get saved. You're already saved. There's a good indication that there's more beyond phase one of salvation. For why does one hope for what he sees? But if we hope for that which we do not see, we, pers uh, we, uh, we persevere, we wait eagerly for it. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses uh, and so helps us to uh, get to the end. And so the Spirit helps us to get there. So we hope and we have perseverance and we're waiting for the end, basically, the same idea there. Uh, also in Revelation 3, I think we'll come back and pick it up there since uh, we're just about out of time. But you might note here uh, with Romans 8, 22 through 25, especially 25, and then in Revelation 3, 9 through 12, especially verse 10, uh, kept the word 
of my perseverance. So the idea of persevering, not to gain salvation, but to gain reward and looking forward with hope that is confident expectation of what the Lord has for us in the future. Well, that pretty much gets us through chapter 6, verse 11. We'll pick those verses up at the beginning of the next session uh, after our break, and then we'll go on to verse 12. Father, once again, we thank you so much for this opportunity to study your word, to look at these passages as part of your word, Father, to edify our soul and to cause us to focus our attention on you. We pray that we would be useful rather than useless and that we would take advantage of this text that we have that you've given us, this marvelous word from you, and that we would exercise under the filling of the Spirit so that we are in training and in preparation for the great things that you have in the life to come as well as whatever it is that you have for us during the remainder of this life on earth. Help us then to do those things again, as we said, that are pleasing in your sight, be obedient to you so that we give all the glory and honor to you, Father. And uh, uh, also uh, this, of course, is in the name of Jesus Christ. But Father, if there's one here without Christ, without hope, without eternal life, we want that person to know that they can have this same blessing, the same hope, the same confidence of eternal reward and blessing. And that is simply through the work of Jesus Christ, your son on the cross. And we pray that they might accept that finished work the fact that he is the God-man Savior, that he came into human history, lived a sinless life, and went to the cross and died and bore the sins of the entire human race. Past, present, and future, yours, mine, everyone's, once and for all. And that because of that work, you can have everlasting life simply by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Won't you do it before you leave this morning? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Father, we thank you again for these things that we've studied. Pray that the Holy Spirit would make them part of our permanent understanding of your word and make them applicable to our situation that confronts us day by day. For we pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.